again uh, for the words we sung and uh, pray that as we turn to the word and uh, consider it, uh, Lord, you will reign in us. Just prepare our hearts and uh, to prepare our minds and for the children as they leave, we pray for them and our teachers, Lord. We just pray that you will bring your word to all of us wherever we are, Lord, we ask in your name. Amen. 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 Brilliant. Thank you very much. I believe children are leaving us. So, the Beatitudes, Right Attitudes, that's the name of the, uh, the passage I've been given. The Beatitudes, Right Attitudes, or to use another phrase, um, the Beautiful Attitudes. Uh, and these attitudes show us what it takes to be blessed by God. Or to put it another way, who can be blessed? The kind of people that are best blessed or congratulated by God. And uh, before we go into it, I think it's important just to note that these aren't, you know, the four last week and the four this week. They're not eight different people. They're the same attitudes displayed through different lenses. In the same way Mark was here with his school uniform on and the eight attitudes, it was one person. And these are eight aspects of our character, eight aspects of our attitudes that we should live our lives by. I guess uh, to put it into a, a more um, or a different, uh, different sphere, uh, you could almost describe them as values. Values are very big in the, in the corporate world. Anyone here work for a company that has company values at all? Yeah? Okay, do you know what they are? <laughs> Values are very big in our place, in so much now that after every meeting we're encouraged to reflect for five minutes on our values to see whether we displayed those values in our meetings. Um, values show us uh, or give us a framework for how we make decisions, how we live our lives. Uh, I've got a few uh, examples of some corporate values. I uh, just wondered if you can dis, uh, work out what company these values are describing, because this is how the companies decide they want to, to be. So do you want to flash the first one up? So this first company cares for people and the planet. They want to be cost-conscious, simple, lead by example, take responsibility, renew improve and be together. Any, any company or, or corporate entity flash out at you when you hear those words? Of course not. So it is Ikea. That's how they want to, uh, to, to be. Um, right, so a uh, bit more niche, but this company, their values are committing to their craft, minimising waste, embracing differences, digging deeper, Leading with optimism. Go on, then. Argos. Argos is a great one, but it's not for this one. But I like it. Um, no, 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 no. It's a bit, bit more niche than, than Apple. It is Etsy. I don't know if you've used Etsy, but that's, that's uh, you know, a, a group that links uh, individual uh, sellers together, and that's what their, their message is. Last one then, uh, I think you're going to get this one because there's a big clue about the product in their values. So, um, we use the company in innovative ways to make the world a better place, we manage sustainable financial growth, and we make fantastic ice cream just for the sake of it. Sorry, so I heard it. Ben and, ben and Jerry's, <laughs> absolutely. So, you can argue whether those three companies, if you have experience of them, live up and, uh, to their values. But values should shape the way we interact with the world. And the values that are important to us show us how we interact with the people around us. And that's what Jesus is saying 
in these passages, giving us uh, some framework, some values, and if we're living in the way that he likes or would want us to be, then people should recognise these attitudes in our lives, which is quite a challenge. So, what's the first one? Um, Be merciful. Be merciful. Show mercy, and the promise that comes with this is that you will be shown mercy. Now, I struggled for a couple of hours trying to get my head around these. What does that actually mean in today's society? What does being merciful mean? And uh, I kind of got the definition. And really, I think it boils down to this. Having compassion or showing forgiveness towards someone that you can punish or harm. Now, Mark had his uh, Parkgate uh, school uh, jumper there, uh, and the thing that kept going through my head is when I was at Parkgate Junior School, uh, did you ever play Mercy, Mark? Where you'd lock onto someone's hands like that, and you have to squeeze as hard as you can on the other person's hand until they shout Mercy. Uh, Kind of like that. Showing forgiveness, showing compassion to someone that you could punish or harm. I had a very good example uh, probably about 15 years ago where for one reason or another I won't go into, I was asked to come to Chippenham Magistrates Court and talk to the magistrate about a little misunderstanding that we had about things. And uh, I walked into the court. Uh, before I even got to the court, I walked into the magistrate's office and uh, a very merciful woman the uh, situation and said, this is pointless, this is stupid, uh, don't worry about it, walk away. She was able to show me mercy. It was in her power to enforce the fine that the, uh, the DVLA thought they would impose, or she had the power to dismiss it, which she did. She showed mercy. The concept of mercy would have had a huge impact on the people that Jesus was talking about. So Jesus was talking to the Jews, they lived in Israel, Israel was occupied by the Romans. The Romans had conquered it, they were the occupying army. They controlled the land. And Roman culture was not based upon compassion or forgiveness or showing mercy. The Romans didn't rule or conquer the world based on those precepts. In fact, much the opposite. They had a very strong, iron-like grip. They dominated and destroyed by being ruthless. And it wasn't just the Romans who had a different idea of mercy. The Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, uh, they were equally guilty of not demonstrating mercy in their life and the way they led the spiritual or the worship of the people. They delighted in the rules of their religion and reveled in their ability to control people through guilt, through their inability to keep the rules that they had set. So this idea of mercy would have been very alien to Jesus' listeners. But what does that mean to us in the 21st century? How do we show mercy to those around us? We're not a controlling army like the Romans. We're not like the Pharisees with a religion to enforce. Who are the people that we could punish or harm and we're showing mercy to? Well, there's lots of ways. I'm just going to pick out a couple here. Forgiving someone. When someone has offended you, when they've done something against you, then you have a choice. Do I forgive them or do I continue holding that grudge? You have the power to show the mercy by forgiving and forgetting or you have the power to let the issue fester, to let the issue grow, controlling both you and the other person. So we can forgive and show mercy in the way that we forgive and interact with people. We can also 
help people. You have the power, I have the power, each of us have the power, no matter what our situation, to do enormous good to those around us, in our immediate circle, to those around us in our communities, to those around us in the world. It's within our power to do good or to do nothing. We could have an act of compassion by donating money to a good cause, by helping people in need. It could be something as simple uh, as buying biscuits for your office. <laughs> as I found the last couple of years, the biggest issue in the offices I've worked at is milk. Uh, having your own little bottle of milk <laughs> and you walk into the kitchen and there's 50 half pint milk bottles all with people's names on. Uh, so I've made it a deliberate ploy of the last 10 years to write in big marker pen, not my name, but please use me, <laughs> just so it assurges anyone's guilt of stealing milk. But showing mercy, holding, withholding a grudge, random act of kindnesses, helping those around us. Why? What does God say in here? Show mercy because what you're doing by helping others, by forgiving others, by being kind to those around you, is you are treating people like God treats you. Because God has forgiven and cares for you, then you can forgive and care for those around. You're mirroring God's behaviour to you, to those around. And actually, that's quite counterculture. Receiving something you don't deserve. Getting something you haven't worked for. It builds the kingdom of God. So as you receive, so you give. So, being merciful. Let's move on, shall we? Second one. Uh, being pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What does this mean? Well, I think this means aligning our thoughts, aligning our feelings, changing our mindset to seeing things from God's perspective. Moving from what we want to what God wants. It means transforming our thinking, transforming our motivations, our character, so we see things the way God sees them. Now, he say here, blessed are pure in heart. The heart is often used in literature, in song, in speech, as to represent the seat of our emotions, to represent the real us. We use the word heart quite a lot. I love you with all my heart. The heart of the matter is this. We give someone a heartfelt thank you. The heart, uh, when we use it in those contexts, expresses the deepest, the most genuine, the most honest emotion. When we use the word heart, it's to describe something that's the real us. It's not fake. It's not made up. It's the real thing. So what Jesus is saying here is, blessed are the pure in heart. It's about saying that our actions, the things that we do, need to come from pure motives. Our motives, our thoughts, our feelings, the real us, the heart of us, that needs to be pure. Not contaminated by selfish thoughts, selfish ambition, greed, or anything else that doesn't come from God. And when we get our heart pure, seeing things how God sees them, then our actions follow and we treat people how God would treat them. We see people how God sees us. So I think that's what he's saying here, aligning our thoughts to be pure, to be God-based. How? Good question. 
<laughs> I'm not going to stand here in the short moments I've got left and, uh, and, and, and pretend to have all the answers here. Uh, in one sense, being pure, you know, we could cut ourselves off from everything around us, everything that contaminates us. We were on holiday last week. We saw a cave where a saint in the 15th century lived all her life to get away from the world, to get away from this, to focus on God. Well, yeah, that's one way. And when we come to church and when we worship him, uh, it's a lot easier to feel closer to God. It's a lot easier to have a pure heart. But then when Monday morning comes, uh, it can be a different thing. And sometimes it may not even be that long. So, yeah, cultivating a pure heart can be difficult. But I think the best place to start, as I said up there, is on a daily basis. Spending our time with God each day to be in his presence, to spend more time thinking, acting like him. Um, we're obviously going through a series here, or you're going through a series uh, in Matthew, starting with Beatitudes. I don't know how long that series is lasting, but in our church in Bath, our, our sermon series has been called Tent, Table, Temple. We've done that for the last 14 months, and we're still not at the end of those three words yet. Tent, Table, and Temple. But it, what it's taught us is actually having that progression of spending time daily with God in your tent, having that alone time with you and God, just you and him in your tent, broadening that out to the table, to those that you spend your day with, being held accountable to those for the way that you develop as Christians and sharing your Christian experience and faith with those around you, around the table. And then lastly, moving out to how we are as a church and how we live as a church and how we show God's purity in there. So three different ways where we can start this journey to purity. In our tent, alone time, in our table, with those around us, in on our church. So as our heart then aligns with him, then our actions change. And again, the kingdom of God comes nearer. Right, time is ticking. We've got uh, two more to go, so let's, let's quickly move on. So, um, showing mercy, being pure in heart, and then Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Well, again, what <laughs> does that mean? Uh, in today's society? Good question, and I don't fully know. If we look at the world around us, we pray, didn't we, for the, the wars around the world, uh, the situation in Ukraine, the conflict there is in the Middle East. Um, there's lots of conflict. There's lots of war. Is that what God, is that what Jesus is telling us here? To be peacemakers? to spend our time wearing white helmets with the UN and being out there and bringing warring factions together? Maybe. But what I also think Jesus is saying here applies at a much more fundamental level. I think it's about how we live out our relationships at work, how we live out our relationships in the home, how we live out our relationships, dare I say it, within the church. It's about striving for understanding and unity in our communities, in our homes, in our families, promoting peace in our everyday situation. But I think it's also important here, just quickly to stress, Jesus isn't saying, be a peacekeeper. <laughs> He's saying, be a peace maker. And they're two quite different things. Keeping the peace is passive, whereas making peace is active. Keeping the peace can preserve the status quo, while making peace can bring bumps. It can bring change. Peacekeeping can be tiring, can be draining, while peacemaking 
can bring renewal, release. Two definitions. Peacemaker, someone who is willing to resolve both outer and inner turmoil in order to establish peace with others and within themselves. Inevitably, peacemaking will require engaging in the conflict, engaging in the tension to help bring the situation to a solid place. Whereas peacekeeping, definition here, peacekeeping desires to maintain the peace by avoiding conflict, typically giving in to the tension or steering clear of disagreement to keep others happy. Peacekeepers hate rocking the boat. Therefore, they will sacrifice their own inner peace to the maintain the facade of peace with others around them. So Jesus isn't saying us to walk on eggshells, not to upset people, but actually to be active, to be proactive in bringing peace to the situations we find ourselves in. That gremlin behind the clock is moving really quick. So how do we do that? Firstly, um, again, I don't feel overqualified in how to bring peace, uh, but I think there's some biblical principles we can follow. Firstly, Trust in the promise that God gives us in John 16, 33. In John 16, Jesus is teaching his disciples about all the things that are going to happen, all the things that are going to happen after he's gone, and also he promises the Holy Spirit to come and help them. And he says this in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world... You may have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome. So he's saying to the, Jew, to the disciples, bad things are going to happen, but I'm telling you this ahead of it so that you will have peace. To us, I think he's saying, trust in what I say despite what you see going on in your life. Where there may be conflict, where there may be financial stress, where there may be sickness, where there may be trauma, where there may be chronic pain, you can find peace. I've told you these things are going to happen. Live your life in God's view, not in the fluctuating circumstances. Right, how else can we do it? By serving others, choosing confession, choosing to repent, displaying forgiveness, serving others. A peacemaker is one who promotes God's peace. Practically, this may look like the well-being of others, loving our enemies, serving the needy, creating an environment of peace in the community that you call to. It may mean practically opening up your home, being hospitable, providing meals. It may mean talking to your neighbour, donating to your local food bank, caring for someone who's in need, forgiving a person who hurt you deeply, or any other of those kind of things. Whatever the need is in our communities, God says, emulate me by being a peacemaker. Pursue me and show me to those around us. Why? We're at peace with the situations God has placed us, then that's a good thing. Right, we're almost done. Lastly, Jesus has a couple of verses here about suffering. When people insult you, when they suffer persecution or hurt me, hurt you because of me, then you are blessed. Living like Jesus, as he said earlier on, may lead to persecution because we're different to the world around us. Um, persecution is a, is a massive thing, but simply it means to be hurt or attacked. Jesus is telling us here, if we're doing the right and good things and people are hurting us, then consider that a blessing because you are bringing his kingdom nearer and be expected to do that. So, briefly then, we've talked about mercy, being merciful, being pure in heart, 
being a peacekeeper, and don't worry if you suffer because of it. Four ways or four attitudes that Jesus has shown us that we can be blessed. We're going to draw to a close, and um, rather than just rushing away, I think it would be good just to spend a, a moment or two, um, just come to a blank screen, um, just reflecting on those four attitudes and about what they may mean at nine o'clock tomorrow morning or in the situations that you are faced in. So uh, can we play? We're going to I've just ask the, the guys to just play through uh, that last song we sang, Reign in Me, Sovereign Lord, just to play reflectively and quietly. And um, just think about today, tomorrow, and the week ahead. So carry on, guys, and I'll, I'll talk over. What will it mean to show mercy in the situations we find ourselves in? What will it mean to be pure, letting go of the things that pull us away from God, those relationships, those habits, changing the way we think about people? What will it mean for us this week to be a peacemaker, repairing those broken relationships, serving our community, maybe inviting that person around for a meal or meeting up for coffee? And lastly, what will it mean this week to understand persecution? Does it mean praying for the persecuted church around the world? Does it mean spending time or phoning that person who's going through a tough time? Thanks. We spoke earlier about values and recognising people through their values. Um, let's just pray, Sherry, about these values, these attitudes that we've spoken about and ask for God's corporate guidance and strength uh, and opportunity to show these this week. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've shown us to live our lives. We pray for the people we meet this afternoon, the people we meet tomorrow, uh, the people we're going to interact with and spend time with this week. Lord, show us what it means to be merciful. Show us how we can forgive. Give us uh, the power to, to let go of those things that hurt us. Lead us uh, in a purer walk, Lord. Show us uh, what it means to be pure in heart and how we can achieve that. I pray for the conflict that we may see, the conflict in the lives of our friends, our families, our communities, the, the things that we struggle with, Lord. Bring us peace, just through your Spirit, bestow upon us a, a, a sense of your calmness, of your, your peaceful uh, guiding and keeping. And Lord, lastly, for those who suffer because of their beliefs in you, Lord. We just pray that you will bring them release. We think of the church uh, globally where uh, people suffer and persecuted because of their faith in you. We just pray that you will bring peace and end to their suffering, Lord. We ask. And lastly, Lord, we just pray that through our actions this week, Lord, that we will be recognised as members of your family, that those attitudes we display, people will see and recognise and help us to be aware of living our lives in the way that you have asked us to, Lord, we ask in your name. Amen. Let's uh, just...
close by singing that song again, shall we, Rain in Me, and then we'll pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll draw up. Rain in me, Sovereign Lord. Rain in me through these attitudes, we pray. Let's stand and sing. And then as we, uh, as we leave, just uh, like to share uh, the, the words of the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord show you his kindness and have mercy on you. May the Lord watch over you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Amen.